Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. The Serpent Oracle. Templars, Mormons, and the Lilith Legacy. Up next, David Brody joins us. An Amazon bestseller next on Coast to Coast AM. And here he is back on Coast to Coast with his latest work, The Serpent Oracle, Templars, Mormons, and the Lilith Legacy. David, welcome back. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me, George. We hear so much about the serpent. I mean, we hear great things about a serpent. I mean, it's a symbol of medicine. It's a symbol of so many positive things. And then we hear it's the symbol of Satan, the devil. Who who wins on this? It, it's crazy. It, it, it's, it's a crazy dichotomy because I mean, we, we, don't, we don't glorify, you know, the spider and we don't demonize the pony. But there's something about the serpent, like you said, we have both good and evil. Um, I, I, and that's really what got me going on this. I, the ancient peoples if you if you go back in history and, and look at the, at, at some of the, the idols that they use and the worshiping that they did the ancient peoples almost universally worshiped the serpent and yet today we think of it as this evil a sign of the, the devil you know the garden of eden story and so so what which is it you know is, is it both is it one is it the other uh, and that's really what got me going on this um, but again you know we we don't we don't have other the shark, for example, we, we demonize the shark. No one glorifies the shark, and yet, and yet the serpent, the snake, sort of falls in between, falls on both sides of the equation. If you go back, you know, a lot of your, your listeners probably listen, uh, watch the ancient alien shows, but go back to Genesis uh, chapter six, uh, and I'll quote: "And it came to pass that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them as wives." So, in other words. The sons of God, some people interpret that as angels, came down to earth and took human women as their wives and, and had children. Other people say, well, the sons of God, these people coming down from the sky, those weren't angels, those were aliens. Um, that, that They weren't coming down from heaven, they were coming down from some from star, some ancient, some, some, some alien star, some outer universal word, whatever. Um, and, and so which is it? I, I don't know the answer to that. But if you look further at some of the language, for example, the, uh, the Anunnaki, uh, who the, who the, I'm sorry, the Sumerians who call uh, the sons of God the Anunnaki, meaning those who came from heaven. Mm-hmm. And then further on in Hebrew, when, when these Anunnaki mated with the human women, they had offspring called Nephilim, from the Hebrew word nafal, meaning to fall. And so are these, are these children who are the product of these aliens slash angels and human women, are they falling from grace, or are they literally falling from the sky? So we see these hints in some of the language that's used that maybe there is something to this whole idea that this, this Genesis chapter 6 isn't talking about angels, but instead is talking about ancient aliens. And then, of course, the great flood of Noah apparently was set up to kill off the Nephilim, wasn't it? Right. There's a whole story about God decided that these people were evil. They were, they, were, they, were, the, 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 they were giants, and they were evil, and we need to wipe them all out, and maybe they didn't all get wiped out. And, you know, that whole thing um, is, is another aspect to that. But if you go back and look at some of the, the statues and figurines, there's a fascinating one that was found uh, in the city of Ur, which is in Mesopotamia, with southern Iraq, today's Iraq. It's at the Iraq Museum. It dates back to about 400 B.C. It's a human body with a snake head, and that was one of their gods. What better way to illustrate this whole concept of of, uh, serpent aliens mating with human women than to have a figurine or a statue or a god that is half human and half serpent? that they are a reflection or an echo of what the ancient people believed happened in their past. If you look at, um, 
at the various cultures that have, for example, uh, serpent worship. Um, it's incredibly widespread. It's it, not only in Mesopotamia. There's the fascinating. Uh, I, I love the Asherah goddess statue. Asherah being the, uh, the, uh, the 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 equivalent of Isis, basically. But she's got she's standing there with bare breasted, and in each hand she's got these snakes wriggling in her hand. And of course, we know about Cleopatra and the asp. How Cleopatra worshipped the snake, and that happens in 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 Mesoamerica with the Aztecs and Quetzalcoatl, and with the Maya and Kukulkan, the Khmer of Cambodia uh, happened in serpent worship in India. Um, there's a fascinating uh, serpent mound in southern Ohio. It's a quarter mile long, and uh, again, the Native Americans apparently were worshiping the serpent as well. So we see this all across on either side of the, of, of the Atlantic Ocean, both both hemispheres. And to me, if we have that much serpent worship and it's that universal, there was something going on that caused it. It's hard to believe that this kind of thing independently bubbled up in so many different cultures, uh, in, like I said, independently. That's not the way that usually works. Usually there's some kind of um, common uh, truth, mm-hmm. common thread to all this that, that, that causes that kind of widespread universal um, behavior. We always want to imitate our gods. So um, I'll, we'll get to it later. There's this whole thing about lots of ancient cultures um, uh, deformed the skulls of their babies to make them look more serpent-like. Well, that's right. They kind of <laughs> elongated them, right? Elongated them. Yeah, we see that not only um, in... Um, in Mesoamerica with the Mayan culture, we see it. Um, Nefertiti, for example, the famous bride of King Tut, we see it in Egypt. We see it on the Isle of Malta. We see it even today in, in, in southern France, the city of, Ta- of Toulouse in southern France. Where there's still vestiges of that. Um, so there's that possibility, the idea that the this, this snake worship comes from that. We always want to imitate our gods, and we believe in this, and so, so that's what we did. It's also possible just that the, the snake is such a, you know, such a powerful thing that we we worshipped it because of its power and its ability to be to to, to, to shed its skin and, and become a re, rebirth itself, reincarnate itself, and so you know immortality, the symbol of immortality. So it, it may have nothing to do with this ancient aliens. It may just be that we've been so fascinated by the snake because of so many cool characteristics that it has, but. Um, you know, I think it's probably the first. I think it's probably that there's vestiges of this memory of uh, the ancient aliens. Is the serpent been given a bad rap, in your opinion? Yeah, very, very, uh, very much so. I think that um, when we when you think about the things that it actually symbolizes, which is um, both wisdom and power. You know, it's it's a very um, uh, I think the, the, the Cleopatra worship of the snake, of the asp, where in the end Cleopatra um, commits suicide by letting the snake bite her. It bites her, it's, right. It's, it's a noble way to, to, to die. There's a whole nobility and, and, and uh, almost reverence for the, for the snake. Um, that's what the ancient people really believed. And... <laughs> it's funny because that sort of carries through. There, there are fascinating uh, groups of uh, fundamentalist Christians in Appalachia who do something called um, ha- who handle snakes. They believe it's it's ordained in in the, the New Testament that they're supposed to do this. And you can go into these churches, and and they literally have bags of rattlesnakes that they'll dump on the floor, and they'll start praying and dancing and singing. And one by one, the parishioners. We'll grab hold of these snakes and, and, and hold them up. And Yow. You've written a lot about the Knights Templars. Do they play a role in some of the serpent worship? Yeah, so, the, so that's really what got me going on this to begin with. The very, the very first time I sort of looked at this, the Templars, um, most of your listeners probably know, they were, they were a secret uh, organization, a secret society, the fighting monks, the army of the medieval church. Uh, but because they were secretive, they had uh, these special secret seals they used for their correspondence. They were also early bankers, so of course the seals were very important for that. But some of their seals, even though they were the, the you know the, the army of the church, they were they were Christians, they were monks. 
um, had some really interesting pagan imagery. In, in particular, there was one seal that had an image of a pagan god named Abraxas, A-B-R-A-X-A-S. In fact, the word abracadabra is believed to derive from Abraxas. And Abraxas was this, this figure that was half serpent or snake and half human. And again, it's a pagan deity. But it struck me as like, you know, where did that come from? And then as I got deeper into the research about the possibility of uh, serpent aliens, you know, I, and, and, I, and I saw that, that figurine I described earlier, the one that was found in Iraq, that's in mm-hmm. the Iraq Museum, that's half snake and half human, which is very similar to the Abraxas. I'm like, well, wait a second, that's really what, what's going on there, is this Templars seem to have figured out or discovered or learned about this ancient tradition of these serpent aliens. Um, you know, people forget that the Templars, even though they were based in Europe, they spent a lot of their time in the Middle East, and during that time period, we're talking early 1100s, early 1300s, when the Templars were finally disbanded and outlawed, but during that time period, Europe was the backwater, and the Middle East was the, 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 the heart of intellectual discovery and education. And so people from Europe who went to Middle East, the Middle East came back with all this knowledge. So I think one of the things that happened is the Templars went to the Middle East, were stationed there, and came back with lots of knowledge that the Church didn't want shared, and that eventually that's why the Templars were outlawed. The Church finally said, okay, enough of this free thinking, enough of this modern thinking, enough of all this idea of the, you know, the, the sun being the center of the universe. We can't have that. And so they eventually put the Templars down. But I think part of that whole thing was the Templar discovery of this ancient serpent alien issue. Mm-hmm. It, it, it manifests itself in some of their... Their, their secret seals, like, for example, Abraxas, the, the, the union of the man and the reptile, is a metaphor for this whole fallen angel thing. Um, and so, starting with the Templars, and then, of course, whenever you start with the Templars, you eventually end up with the Freemasons, because many historians and scholars, including myself, believe that the Freemasons, uh, after the Templars were disbanded, the Freemasons sort of became a reconstituted version. Right, they're the off, basically the offshoots of the Templars, aren't they? Exactly, exactly, and carried that forward. And even in Freemasonry, we have some of these interesting symbols. They, they have a, uh, a, 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 a something called the, the, brazen, um, the brazen serpent ritual. You know, this goes back to, I mentioned it earlier, where, where Moses... Uh, put up a post and, 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 and a serpent on it, and, and, and people who, who looked on that serpent would be cured. But this idea of the serpent being part of, the, of one of the Masonic rituals. And, and in, my, in my book, in, this, in, this, in, this, in, in the Serpent Oracle, the, the main antagonist in the story is a Freemason who decides he wants to try to, to, to take over Freemasonry and, and make it a group of serpent worshippers sort of under the umbrella of Freemasonry. And this actually is based on something that, that, that happened in, in the real world, something that happened in, um, in started in, in the Philippines and made its way to California. This group of Freemasons who, who, who had a subgroup known as the Grand and Glorious Order of the Knights of the Creeping Serpent. Jeez. And this idea that, these, that the serpent is somehow to be admired and, 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 and revered. Um, but in, in, in the story, in my story, the, the, the trigger for the whole thing is, is this Masonic character who wants to have Freemasonry go back to the idea of being uh, serpent worshipping. And the Knights Templar, they were the holders of the Shroud of Turin, weren't they? Possibly, yeah. That's one of the things that they, what were, I've heard. they were believed to have. Um, you know, they were... The one we we could talk for another hour, and, and I, I love this part of the conversation because all my books are based on the mysteries of the Templars. But one of the big mysteries is what did the Templars discover when they were in the Holy Land back in the early parts of the 1100s that made them so incredibly powerful so quickly? They became the, the wealthiest, most powerful 
force in all of Christendom uh, for about 200 years. Um, you know, did they discover the Ark of the Covenant? Did they discover the Holy Grail? The, you know, what was it that they discovered? Was it treasure? Was it the, the Templars came back and said, hey, look what we learned? Um, and then the other side of that coin is, what was it 200 years later that finally had the Church say, enough, we've, we've put up with you guys long enough, we're done with you, even though you're our fighting force, and even though for 200 years you fought the Crusades on our behalf, we can't have it anymore. We're, we're done with you. You're too much of a, a loose cannon. We're worried you're going to reveal things you shouldn't reveal. No one's quite sure what those two things were. The thing that happened in the early 1100s and the thing that happened in the early 1300s, it's probably the same thing, but what that secret was. Um, and no one's been able to quite figure out what it was. But one possibility is this whole idea of serpent DNA. There, there's, um, there's a fascinating book, um, and I, I went deep into it in a, in a previous novel, um, talk, talking about the passages in, in Genesis. Um, it's called the Genesis 6 Conspiracy. And I'm picking it up right now as I'm talking to you by a guy named Gary Wayne. And, and he, go, he goes into that, and he basically divides the world into good and evil uh, based on, you know, who survived during the Great Flood, aliens or, or not. This is based on whether it was Cain or Abel, and he tracks this whole thing. But his point basically is, and we, and we see this manifesting itself a little bit today. Tell us about the cover of the Serpent Oracle book. So that is, uh, the, the, the cover um, is a uh, the all-seeing eye surrounded by the classic uh, Ouroboros idea of a snake swallowing its own tail. And, and that is inspired by um, a, a, a real symbol that I found that was used in Freemasonry. So again, the all-seeing eye, of course, you see it on the dollar bill, and everyone knows that's a, it's a, the triangle with the eye inside. Um, it's a Masonic symbol. But I was surprised, and this goes back to an earlier question you asked, you know, do the Templars, do the Freemasons have a history of serpent worship? And it's there, but it lies just below the surface. But I found this image of, uh, again, a Masonic image of the all-seeing eye surrounded by the serpent, as if, um, as if they were part of you know, the same, uh, symbolically, the, the serpent encompasses and surrounds everything the Masons do. And um, I thought it was a cool cover. cover image. Oh, it is. It's well done. Yeah, thank you. But, but mostly because I think it's, sim- it's uh, again, in Freemasonry especially, everything's symbolic. Everything has many levels of meaning. It's a secret society, the society with secrets. And, uh, and I, 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 one of the things I love to do, I'm not a Freemason myself, but I love to sort of try to figure out what it is they're trying to tell us without actually telling us. What uh, would you like people to bring away with themselves after they read the Serpent uh, Oracle? The whole idea that, A, we may actually descend from serpent aliens, which I think is, a, on, its, on its surface, an outlandish idea. But when you look at it more carefully, there's a decent amount of evidence to go to support it. So that's sort of fun to think about. So that's one possibility. But I think even, even more fundamentally, the idea that, um, that the ancient peoples may have been closer to you know, sort of universal truths and universal knowledge than we are today. I think that's the thing I want people to think about when they read this book in particular. David, do you think the serpent has gotten a bad rap? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, the serpent historically has been to, been associated with knowledge and wisdom. And, and again, we talked about that last hour. The Church doesn't didn't, didn't want that. I shouldn't say doesn't. That's not fair. Didn't back, uh, you know, back when we were talking medieval times, didn't want that, didn't want its, its flock to be educated. And so anything associated with knowledge was considered undesirable, and, and, that's, and that's where the association came. Um, but, uh, you know, again, it, it, the, the, the snake is just a snake. It does what it does to survive. Do you believe in the Bible? So I've always felt that the Bible is a... Is, uh, compilation of ancient legends passed down, but if you ask me if I believe that the Bible is the, sort of the word, the sacred word of God, no. But I think it's a compilation of ancient stories and legends and myths that were passed down over the millennia. Let's go to the phones. Tony, truck driving in New Mexico, gets us started. Hi, Tone. Go ahead. Hi, George. Thank you. 
Hey, I got uh, two quick questions. All right. The first one is, is where do you, does it say in the Bible about Eve not being um, Adam's first wife? Because I've never heard of Lilith before. Let's do that one first, David. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a very good question. I don't know if that's something that's in um, the, the Talmud, which is um, uh, sort of a commentary on the Bible in, um, in Judaism, or whether it actually is uh, in the Bible itself. I don't believe it's in the Bible itself. I think it is something that comes from the Talmud. Um, yeah, I always thought that Eve was Adam's wife, and that was it. Yeah, no, I think this comes from the Talmud. Um, so again, the Talmud is sort of the accumulated knowledge uh, of all the all the the main Jewish rabbis for about six or seven hundred years. Uh, don't quote me on this. Maybe two hundred A.D. to seven hundred A.D. in that range, and they basically put together all the all the knowledge that had been accumulated. And I think so. I think the Lilith story comes from that. Let's go to your second question, Tony. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, didn't uh, God curse? the uh, serpent in the uh, um, Garden of Eden when she gave all the information and deceived Eve to slither on the ground and took away his legs and such? Um, you know, I'm sorry, I missed some of that question. You faded in and out. Could, could I, could I ask you to repeat that? I'm sorry. Did God curse the serpent? Uh, you know, I don't know the answer to that. I'm not... I'm not um... You're not a theologian. I'm not. I'm not a theologian. Do you know the answer to that, George? I think he did. I think he did curse the serpent, and uh, as uh, that would make sense, perfect sense that he would. You know, and uh, it, ever since then, the serpent has been perceived as being evil or part of a uh, Satan. I would, if if reader or if listeners are curious about this, I would I would Google Lilith and and look at the pictures. She's almost universally. Uh, portrayed with a serpent around her neck or wrapped around her legs, naked as a temptress. It's a, oh, oh the, it's the Catholic evil. Church portrays Lilith as evil. There's no yeah. doubt about that. Yep, yeah. and she's always got the always got the snake with her. Um, a lot of modern feminists have sort of adopted her as sort of you know a, a counterbalance against the church. But the Lil, the Lilith character, the Lilith personage, has become. Uh, romanticized in some feminist movements. But again, she's always pictured with the serpent. Interesting. Hank in St. Louis. Hi, Hank. Go ahead. Hank, you there? Nope. He's not there. Let's move on to Linda in the state of Washington. Hello, Linda. Hello again, George. Hey, Lynn. Uh, hey, uh, I wanted to make a quick statement that most of the presidents have been Masons, and the uh, Constitution and Bill of Rights was written in a way that said not for the people, but of the people. But I wanted to make a comment about or, or have an opinion about Lilith, which I know you won't agree with, George, but I think Lilith was Adam's first wife from what I've studied and learned, and uh, she would not accept God's misogenic, controlling, uh, bullying tactics, so she left, and it's kind of like Joe Kennedy, uh, his daughter, did not want to follow in the sibling's footsteps and get into civic service and politics. She wanted to be a free spirit, and he wound up putting her in an institution, gave her uh, shock treatment. She spent her whole life that way because she tried to rebel against her father. Oh, yeah, turned her into a vegetable, Linda, to be sure. But uh, David, back to Lilith. I mean, uh, could she have been railroaded in this thing? Right. Well, that, 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 I, what the caller said is exactly right. She refused to be the subservient, um, you know, wife to, to to Adam. Adam didn't like it. He complained to God, and God said, "All right, we'll we'll, we'll, go, we'll go get you a new wife, a new wife, and we'll cast Lilith aside." And that's exactly what happened. And, and the caller used the word misogynistic, and I think that's a that's an accurate description to, to what was happening back then. And um, 
Oh, actually, and also the caller mentioned something about um, the the Constitution being written by, uh, being signed, the Declaration of Independence being signed by many Freemasons. Um, I did want to make the point, we talked about it earlier, the idea that the that the Freemasons sort of inherited the, the mantle of the Knights Templar. One of the pieces of research I just learned about, which I wanted to share, was that the cornerstone for the White House was laid by George Washington, um, and that was done on October 13th, 1792. And of course, October 13th is a very famous day uh, in Templar history. That's the day the Templars were put down, October the 13th, 1307. Um, so I think, and we know, we know that, that George Washington, when he, when he laid that cornerstone, was wearing his Masonic apron. I don't think that was an accident that they chose, that they chose the date of the Templar put down to lay the cornerstone for what was going to be the new Jerusalem uh, here in America. So I I think that's just another piece of evidence that sort of ties the the, the Freemasons to the the Templars, this whole continuum. But I don't think that that date was an accident. I don't think so either. East of the Rockies, Lloyd is with us in South Carolina. Thanks, Lloyd. Go ahead. Sir, you tell me you are not a Freemason, correct? You're asking Uh, you're asking the guest? David, are yes, you a, I am, sir. Yeah, you a Freemason, yes, David? That is correct. I am not a Freemason. Your research into Freemasonry, sir, uh, and I am a Freemason. I've also been a Demolay since 1976. And if you know anything at all about history, you know who Demolay is. Sure. And what happened on October third on, on October thirteenth, thirteen oh seven. Right. Uh yeah. <laughs> Your research is questionable at best and non-existent at worst. I will say that I have been a guest lecturer at over a hundred Masonic lodges over the past eight or nine years, and um, generally speaking, before I publish anything, I run it by four or five senior-level Freemasons, thirty-second, thirty-third degree guys, Rosicrucian guys, other societies. So. Pretty much, I'm pretty comfortable with my research when it when it comes to this stuff. So let's let's get I his read the, read the books or not, but uh, I, I'll stand by my research. Let's get his main issue, Lloyd. What are you opposed to the most that uh, David has passed on about Freemasonry? Well, thirty second and thirty third degree Freemasonry, thirty second. Okay, the highest. You're correct. Third, third, I'll, I'll, I'll stick with the thirty third. Thirty uh, third and other senior members. Thirty second doesn't really mean anything. You're right. Thirty third and or other. Uh, you know, um, past grandmasters of, of, of state lodges. Uh, people have been in, in the craft for a number of decades. It's an emotional topic, Freemasonry, isn't it, David? Very much so. And, and, and by the way, I happen to think what the Freemasons do is, is they do great work. I have a lot of admiration for them. Um, you know, I write about them a lot, generally in a positive way, Um this caller is one of the few times I've had any Freemason express a negative reaction to my research, which is why I asked, I wondered if he's read my books, because I think that if, if you read them, one of the things I do is I, I, I put a lot of notes in the end so that if people have questions about where my, my research comes from, I, I put sources in the back. And so, you know, if I make a, an assertion about some kind of Masonic history or ritual or whatever, I, I, I source it in the back. Carl in Boston. Welcome, Carl. Hi, George. Thank you for taking my call. Sure thing. I, I just wanted to say I, I strongly disagree with uh, David, the uh, guest. Uh, the Holy Bible, King James Version, is the Word of God. However, the Mandela Effect may have changed a few words. There's some things in the Old Testament I don't remember. But anyway, I was going to say my dad passed. He was a 33 degree, 33rd degree Mason, and he was very holy. He taught me a lot. He may not have been the same. I was Baptist. He was Lutheran. But anyway, I, I, this next comment I wanted to make, I am anointed. And with the uh, authority of the Lord, as in Isaiah fifty four seventeen. George, do you want me to read that verse? No, no probably not. Okay. But just give okay. us a little paraphrase. Well, uh, I, well, basically it just says, uh, any weapon formed against me shall not prosper, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that the servant of the Lord has the power of the Lord. And I want to say, with that being said, we are in end times. Please repent, everyone. Please repent. Find your Lord, your whoever you call God, 
and ask for forgiveness. My tribal name is Zero Back Gure, and I am with the Creator. You have seen my work recently with the new galaxies and everything. I, I fasted for a long time, and I prayed for three things. I'm not going to tell you what they are, but one of them was life, and that was created the next morning. And um, I just wanted to say, you know, please read. The Bible is real. The Bible is is what it is. And I, I know you don't think it is, but, you know, Masons are not satanic. Masons, I, I, I maybe I don't have room to speak because I'm not a Mason, but I know my my dad taught me a lot and tried to get me to become one, but I, um, I, I couldn't follow suit because I went the military route. Well, that's not done. That's not all bad either. Thanks for your service. But David, I haven't heard you uh, call the Freemasons satanic. No, I, I mentioned another author who did. I, I don't. I don't believe that they are not at all. I think um, well, it was described to me once by a senior level Freemason who said that the difference between um, established religion, particularly the Catholic Church, and Freemasonry is that the Church believes that man. Kind, humankind, men, whatever, are naturally evil and need religion to be made good, to be made good, pardon me. And the Freemasons believe that man is naturally good. Now, I would agree with them, don't you? Be, I, yes, I do. And I think that, and I, and I love the fact that, that they are so egalitarian. I love the fact that uh, there's a great story about, I believe it was President Truman, who uh, was a Freemason, and uh, his gardener happened to be the master of his lodge. And Truman would always defer to the gardener whenever he saw him, because in in the Masonic lodge they both belonged to, the gardener was senior to Truman, and and so I love the fact that in the Masonic lodge any person, no matter their status in society, can rise up to be the the master of the lodge. Um, but there's a lot of things that Freemasons do that I think uh, we could learn a lot from. Let's go to Eric in Indianapolis, Indiana. Welcome to the show. Hi, Eric. Take it away. Hi. Um, I'm sort of confused about your guest tonight. I thought he, I thought he said earlier that he didn't believe in the Bible. I mean, um, so what? Uh, he talks like he does when he. All right, um, let's let's let him clarify that. Go ahead, David. I think what I said was I believe that the Bible is a compilation of um, myths and legends and stories that have been passed down. So. Um, I don't believe it's the Word of God, but I believe that a lot of the stories are a reflection and an echo of of legends that have truth to them. Was there something in particular you think I uh, misstated about? Yeah, there's a couple of, uh, you know, two or three stories I know for sure that it really convinces me of, of the Bible, and that's uh, that God sent his, sent his only begotten Son on on this earth to to hang on the cross for the, to to yeah, I'm sorry I'm sorry I'm sorry my my question back to you was did I say something in particular that made you question the, that supported your assertion that that I was being inconsistent I, what what in particular did I say that you thought was inconsistent Well I just sounded like you didn't you didn't believe none of the uh, of the the Bible and and you're talking about the Bible like you do believe. I mean, when you talk about Adam and Eve and stuff like that. No, as I said, I think those are stories that have uh, have truth to them, but I don't believe that the Bible itself is the Word of God. Which is important for a lot of people, of course, but that's right. your understanding and your belief system, David, which you're entitled to. Let's go next to Joe in Monterey, California. Hi, Joe. Go ahead. Thank you for taking my call, George. Sure, George. Hmm. Wow, snakes abound. They're everywhere. Um, let's just see if we could keep it to, to the snakes uh, in what I'm about to say. Um, the caduceus is, uh, you don't understand the uh, symbolism of the caduceus. This goes back way before the, uh, we used it for many things. It's, um, it's representing the Ida and Pagali. Those are the two snakes that intertwine the Shishuma. This is in the physical body. This is a negative and positive energy, male and female energy. And the middle, the staff, 
is called the shishuma, which is the kundalini. You raise the kundalini to the top of the head, and that's fire coming out. That's enlightenment. And that goes back way back when. Now, I'm sorry, I'm sorry who, they, who, who mentioned the caduceus? I, I talked about the rod of the Well, you, you, mentioned the, the, you mentioned the symbol symbolism of the medical profession as far as right, snake. That, that, and, that's a single snake, the rod of Asclepius, a single snake, not a double snake. Okay. Well, I'm going to continue on what the snake represents. Okay. Um, the snake is a part of enlightenment. Um, uh, the Hindu gods, the god Shiva, which is the destroyer of the illusion, has a snake around his neck. That's another symbol that you see. In the Kabbalah and Tarot, they have two posts. It's the two of wands, which is called the lightning path. That's the middle way. Buddha talks about the middle way to enlightenment, the fast enlightenment. Now, as far as the masons and the, and the, uh, and the what's it called, uh, and the, what's it called, and the Templars, the Templars were supposed to have been given the sword and the point, uh, the spear of destiny, what they call the spear of destiny. At one time, they held it, and then they passed it off, at least we are told they passed it off to the Masons, and there was, as you recalled, the splitting, we call it the splitting of the elm, where they split, where there's an outer organization and an inner secret organization, and this is probably with a lot of different groups. They have an outer, which is general public, and an inner, which are the people that are connected. Um, the flaw of the Masons... Yes, I do agree with okay. that last statement you made. What, what is your point here, though, Joe? Well, there's a lot of hidden symbol, uh, symbols. There's symbol, There's a uh, meaning behind the meaning, especially in the, te- especially in the Masons. The flaw is a uh, black and white checkerboard. You'll see that uh, a lot uh, in different uh, cult or uh, secret societies. That represents duality, but in the occult, the high teachings of the occult, there is a plurality. There are three energies, not just left and right, yes or no, but a neutral path. And the symbols of the Masons are the, uh, the square and the compass, which goes back to Hiram Abith in the Old Testament. He made the temples of Solomon. He was an architect using uh, sacred geometry, and that represents that. And the Melchizedek order was, goes way back then, and they were supposed to connect the kings uh, throughout history. It's a secret order, and they would connect them to the power of God. And that's, the, that's what the Melchizedek order was supposed to Well, okay, it's a little over our pay grade, I think. But did you follow him at all, David? Um. Yeah, so uh, what he's, a lot of what he said was, was correct. The, the checkerboard in the Masonic Lodge is indeed a symbol of duality. Um, the whole idea of uh, you know, yin and yang, uh, feminine and, and masculine, good and evil, the whole idea that that, um, that sort of representation of, 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 of humanity. And he's right about that. Um, and, and, and much of Freemasonry is based on, on duality. What, what I tried to do in this story was, was get deeper, and, and what the last caller just said was that a lot of what happens in Freemasonry is under the surface, and I totally agree with that. What, I'm try, what I try to do with this book and prior books is to get into some of these secret societies and try to ferret out the symbolism and what does it really mean, what's the source of it, and what is it they're trying to to, to keep from us, you know, I, I want to know the secret. I want to be, you know, I want to, I want to figure out the mysteries. Um, I may have it wrong, I, you know, I don't know, but uh, I, I think for the most part, based on the reaction I get when I speak at Masonic lodges, I'm on the right track. All right, my friend, keep in touch, David. What's your next book? So I'm working on something now. Uh, he, the gentleman who just called talked about Hiram Abiff, the architect who built King Solomon's Temple, the architect from from Lebanon, by the way. But um, he, the, one of the ways that they built this temple, God said, I don't want you building the temple with metal tools because those metal tools may have once been weapons. And so, according to legend, there was a special thing called the Shamir, S-H-A-M-I-R. You're going to write about that. That's pretty good. Keep in touch. I'm George Norrie, somewhere out there on Coast to Coast AM. We'll see you on our next edition. Until then, be safe, everyone.
The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.